It's a great marriage between a tune and a text there. We'll be in Joshua today. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. We'll read the whole chapter, but we're only prim- well, we're primarily going to focus on the, the latter part. But we'll read the whole chapter to get it in its context. Joshua chapter 5. Let's hear the word of the Lord once more. As soon as As all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. And at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeoth Haraloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who had come out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt, had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. In stark contrast to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise, Joshua made flint knives and circumcise. The Lord swore to them that He would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom He raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. And while the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his sword with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. May God bless the reading of His holy word. We'll go before Him once more in prayer. O Lord, this is Your day. This is Your house. This is Your Word. These are Your people. Glorify Your Son. For He is worthy. May we fall on our faces as Your servant Joshua did in humble adoration before Him. 
And may it be said of us that what he asks us to do, we did so. I pray that you would help us, Lord, fill us with all grace to worship you as you are worthy and to do all that you have commanded. We pray these things in your name that you alone might be glorified. Amen. Well, the children of Israel in the historical context of this this text are in a unique position. They've left Egypt now 40 years ago and they've spent almost all of that time as nomads in the desert outside the promised land looking in. And they're on the outside of the promised land not because the promise of God was ineffectual. It wasn't that God's power, might, or His grace had run out. But because Israel had been faithless, ungrateful, and disobedient to God, which was everything that those Canaanites were, whose lands they were going to dispossess. And so for nearly four decades, the nation of Israel wandered in the desert as the faithless and disobedient generation died off. They came to a a sad end. They had seen so many wonders of God in the plagues on Egypt, in the parting of the Red Sea, in the daily provision of manna. Daily wonders from God. And yet, their testimony is, they died faithless in the desert. They had seen the wonders of God in the past, but they did not trust Him with the future. And they cowered in fear when they saw the sons of Anak, said, we can't take this land. And only Joshua and Caleb had faith to go take the land. Moses also has died. Their leader, the one whom the Lord had appointed to lead the people. The Lord ultimately was their leader. Moses was but following the Lord. But as far as the the human um, appointed leader, that was Moses, chosen by God. So now Israel is a new generation, makes up this nation, and they have a new leader. They have Joshua, who's just been installed in the first chapters of the book bearing his name. And he was a man just as mighty in the Lord as Moses. But he had an entirely different calling. Calling. Same God, entirely different calling. Whereas Moses had been called to lead the people out of Egypt, Joshua was called to lead them into the promised land. And his work looked different than Moses had. And God met with Moses at the burning bush and promised Moses, we read in Exodus 3.20, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. Moses was told beforehand uh, that God would work wonders on his behalf. He had the promise of God. These things would take place as the elected leader of Israel, and that his enslaved people would come out. And Moses, even after hearing all the promises of God, still complained to God, still requested that the Lord choose someone else. And so then God split the duties between Moses and Aaron, that Aaron would then speak. Moses would still be required to obey the Lord and be the agent through whom the signs were performed. And Joshua was not promised that signs and wonders would accompany his conquest. The Lord didn't promise him a string of miracles as he did Moses. He only promised to be with Joshua. And we read that in Joshua 1 verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses... So I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And that was all the comfort Joshua needed. The Lord is not going to show all these signs and wonders and, to use human terminology, go through the trouble of bringing His people out of Egypt to not see them into the promised land. So just the presence of God that Joshua had followed as he was Moses' right-hand man was enough for Joshua to step out in faith and take these lands for the children of Israel. 
He had not been specific, promised any specific miracles, but certainly the Lord would work wonders for Joshua. Joshua was full of miracles too. And such as one right uh, following our text, t- the taking of Jericho. Uh, the walls collapsed without a siege. Or how about when the sun stood still and the hailstones rained down from heaven? Certainly the Lord did act in Joshua's behalf in in miraculous ways. And even though Joshua did not have all of the the promises of God that that God would work signs and work wonders, Joshua did not ask that the Lord choose another. He assumed the role of responsibility that was laid before him and took up the, 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 the task of leading this nation now to conquer the God of Moses was the God of Joshua. You know, people can analyze Joshua and what made him a manly man and a great general. I think we have in a verse summed up all of the grace of God toward Joshua because it was the grace of God toward Joshua that, that made him what he was. Satan in, in Zechariah 3 accuses Joshua until what? Until the righteousness of Christ is placed upon him. That may be Zephaniah 3. I can't remember. I think it's Zechariah. But in Exodus 33, verse 11, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, Exodus 33, 11, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. This is a young man that knew what it was like to behold the glory of God. Not just, not just in, the, in the miraculous wonders of God, but just the holy abiding presence of God in His sacred place of worship. The tent referring to the tabernacle. And He would not depart. This was important to Him. To be in the presence of God. To be at the worship place of God. Where His special presence was. And so the present... The promise of God's ever presence was all Joshua needed to be strong and courageous. We associate that phrase with, with Joshua, and well we should, because it's three, three times in the opening chapter, in, in, in verse 6, verse 9, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, eventually I'll get my thoughts together. God tells Joshua in each of those verses, be strong and courageous. Why, do we, why does he need to hear it three times? Well, the same reason we have all, we have the, the whole counsel of God full of his gospel. We need to hear these things over and over again. We forget. We're prone to forget. And so, this is what, the Lord, what Joshua needed to hear from the Lord. Be strong and courageous. That's what it's going to take to overthrow these, these nations. It's going to take the word of God, going out in faith in the promise of God to take these nations. It's not by human might they're going to do it. Joshua may have fought the battle of Jericho, but it was the Lord that gave the victory. And so we come to our text in chapter 5. We've got the nation, which consists of a young generation. They have no homeland. They're a nation with no homeland. And they're not trained in war. And yet they're told to go out and seize this land from these mighty sons of Anak. They're not trained in war. They've spent all their life growing up in the desert. And their present position means that there's no retreat. The muddy Jordan is behind them. There's no going back over that Jordan. The Lord parted it for them so the whole nation could make it over. They're not going to get back over the Jordan. There's no retreat. For Joshua, for this young generation and this young leader. No retreat. And there's no advancing unless they advance in obedience. With faith in the the word of God to take these, these nations. Unless they go by faith to overthrow Jericho. That's the next step. Joshua's next step was clear. There's no retreat. The Jordan River's behind me. and there's The only way I can advance is... Jericho, step one. And so we pick up our text, verse 13 of of Joshua chapter 5. When Joshua was by Jericho. And here we meet with a man in the midst of his duties. 
He had ordered the new generation of Israelites to be circumcised according to the command of God, which we read in the opening eight verses. Circumcision was the outward sign that they were in covenant with God. And so it's, it's sad, though not surprising, that the faithless and disobedient generation had failed to circumcise their sons. Covenant of God was not important to them. They had been faithless, disobedient, ungrateful. And the original commandment was to have them circumcised on the eighth day after their birth. That was what God had told Abraham when he instituted the uh, Old Testament sign of circumcision. That's in Genesis 17, 9 through 14. And even though this new generation had grown up in the desert without being circumcised, Joshua circumcised the people. Before they can go take these lands, they first had to be right with God. And Joshua's doings here in obedience to the Lord shows us that it's never too late to get back to obeying God. It's never too late. They had been 40 years in the desert uncircumcised. And yet the Lord said, make flint knives, circumcise this people. Sign of my covenant with them. And Joshua did so. Joshua did so. It's never too late to get back to obeying God. Point one of our, our outline, for those of you who like to keep track by an outline. Never too late to get back to obeying God. And when you do you find His promises are still true. God required that the males be circumcised in order for the the people to partake in the Passover. The lambs were killed at twilight on the 14th day of the first month, which we're told that in Exodus 12.6. And this is exactly the example Joshua followed. In verse 10, they kept Passover on the 14th day of the month, in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And so the Passover was now celebrated by this generation that had been circumcised. So they're they're, they're getting back. They didn't just obey one command of God. They performed the, the, the act of circumcision, the covenant seal, covenant sign. Now they're keeping the Passover, the covenant meal, according to the command of God. And so these, both of these duties have been fulfilled under the leadership of Joshua. And so his next duty, the next thing, item on his agenda, is to conquer Jericho. Take these lands. And so Je- by Jericho is where we find him. This was Joshua's next assignment. We know from verses 3 and 4 of Joshua 1. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This was the promise of God. And some may pause here and wonder, wait, I thought God is love. So why is He now commanding the extermination of these Canaanites? Something doesn't seem to... Add up. Well, the answer lies in the twofold purpose of God that God had promised to give the land to the descendants of Abram. Promised way back in Genesis 12, verses 6 and 7. He was going to make a great nation of, of Abraham. And God would punish the Amorites of the land for their sin. Just a few pages later from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. In verse 13, we read, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. That was their time in Egypt, after Joseph passed away. And all Jacob brought his descendants there. Jacob's passed away, Joseph's passed away, and the Hebrews have stayed in Egypt. But Verse 14, But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions, some of which were tragically used to make the golden calf. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. 
After, after uh, a while, though, it was, and the Lord was going to drive them out. We must note, as we read in Deuteronomy 9, that Israel was not a holy nation coming in to finally dispossess an unholy nation. No, Israel was not more righteous than the Lord's people. If the Lord were to mark iniquities, the Amorites would not stand, the Israelites would not stand, and us Americans would not stand. No one can stand. So it's not that Israel had righteousness and the Lord was rewarding Israel for her inherent righteousness by giving that nation this land. God was punishing the Amorites for their sins against Him and simultaneously giving His people the land that He promised. Ironically, tragically, in time, the Assyrians, another pagan nation, would punish Israel for her sins against the Lord and drive them away. And the, the, the ten northern tribes. So, Joshua is told, march to Jericho. He had not only obeyed in regards to keeping the Passover and circumcising the sons of Israel, but he was on the brink of further obedience. He's by Jericho, and he lifted up his eyes and looked. Maybe he's surveying the, the, the city, drawing up battle plans in his mind. How are we going to take this? He's attending to his duties. Maybe he's meditating on the promises of God. He's on the brink of further obedience outside the city, planning his attack according to the promise of the Lord. And so it was after the completion of two duties and looking toward the next that Joshua had at this place his face-to-face encounter with God. Matthew Henry had a very good remark on this. We may then expect the discoveries of the divine grace when we are found in the way of our duty and are diligent and sincere in our attendance on holy ordinances. And there was Joshua doing the Lord's duties and planning to do what the Lord had given him to do, the next duty. And that's when the Lord met with him. Behold a man. Now he's gone from surveying the city. Behold a man. Joshua would have been no doubt on high alert over Jericho. The looming battle, no doubt on his mind. And he was so focused on his duty that when he sees a man with a sword drawn approaching, his frame of mind disposes him to conclude that this man must either be in league with Jehovah and the Israelites that are about to march and do warfare, or this man is one who's about to be on the defense and defending the city. Natural conclusion to come to. And so, in what can only be called an act of boldness, Joshua asks the man a question. And positions himself to face the man alone, depending on what his answer is. Behold a man. And this man is not just an image bearer of God. This is the one whose image is born. This is the one who perfectly images God. The God-man. Pre-incarnate. With a sword drawn in his hand. This commander, it will uh, in verse 2 of chapter 6, is... Uh, Identified as Yahweh. In, in your, your English Bibles, it should have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the divine name of God. This is God. Come to meet with Joshua outside of Jericho. This is not some angel. Any portrayal that tries to make this some created angelic being is sadly mistaken. Unbiblically mistaken. This is the one who made and commands all the angels that has come to meet with Joshua. And the fact that Jesus appeared to Joshua with his sword drawn indicates that 
he approved of Joshua's looking over Jericho to attack it, which was the command of God to Joshua. We're not called <laughs> under, new, under the new covenant to go and attack lands and take lands. The crusades were a waste of time. We are called to advance with the gospel. That's what we're called to advance. And that's our duty. But Joshua's was to take Jericho. And so he was obeying God, attending to his next duty. And it's, it's interesting that when Joshua is in the way of obeying God, God appears. He doesn't just meet with Joshua, but he comes with a sword drawn. He meets with Joshua ready to help with the means to encourage Joshua in what he was about to do. He doesn't come to Joshua with you know, setting up a tea party. He doesn't come to Joshua you know, to play checkers. He doesn't come with a musical instrument. He comes with a sword because Joshua is going to war. And so the way the Lord comes to Joshua is significant too. He comes with, not only comes because he said he would be with Joshua, which is comfort enough, but he comes with his sword out to meet with Joshua to show, I'm here to encourage you in this. Joshua asks the man, are you for us or for our adversaries? Respectful enough of a question, but no pleasantries. He's a man at war. Are you for us or for our adversaries? If Joshua had simply slipped away silently upon seeing the man, we would have, we would have rightly denoted Joshua a coward. He would have insulted the blessing of encouragement that his maker and his general had for him. If Joshua had suddenly attacked, it would have been undue, unprovoked violence. Joshua would have been found opposing the one who promised him, who promised the nation, victory over the pagans. If the man is for them, there's no reason he should have to die. But if the man is not feared Jehovah, then he will be doomed to destruction with the rest of the Canaanites, and Joshua is prepared to do so. So he asks, are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14, and he said no. He said no. It's the Hebrew negative particle, lo. just means no. Some translations render it neither. Some, and I think the King James says just nay, no. Here's the commander of the army of the Lord. This is who he's for. He leads his troops into battle. This is not some general that, that sits back and has all his minions do his dirty work. This is a general that leads. And really, the only true leaders in this humble redneck's opinion are the ones that are actually in the trenches fighting with the troops. I don't have any use for a leader that stays behind a desk. I want one that's down there in the battle with the troops, covered in blood, leading his troops onward. Those are the leaders we need. Servant leaders, not pencil pushers, ivory tower academics, but leaders getting their hands dirty, dirtier than all. This is the commander of the army of the Lord that leads his troops into battle. He is the one ultimately in control of Israel's destiny. Not Joshua, not Moses, not David. He's the commander of the army of the Lord. And which army does he command? Well, which army does he not command? Is the question. He is the commander of the armies of creatures, the insects that infiltrated Egypt. He commanded the frogs. He commanded the gnats. He commanded the flies. He commanded the locusts. He's the Lord of hosts. All those armies are under His command. He's the commander of the armies of angels. In 2 Kings 6, the servant of Elisha is given over to despair. 
thinks he's about to be slaughtered. The, the, the king of Syria and his army are around them. And 2 Kings 6.15, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He, Elisha, said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The mountain was full. Once his eyes were were opened. This is the commander of angel armies. We don't take comfort in the fact that our comfort is not ultimately derived in the fact that the Lord commands angel armies. It's ultimately in the Lord Himself. But He does have angels who are ministers, the Bible speaks of, sent to do His will, sent to comfort His people, sent to bring them glad tidings. Jesus said on the cross, Could I not ask for 10,000 angels, legions of angels, and my Father would give them to me. It's the same one that meets with Joshua on the plains of Jericho that hangs on the cross. He's got angels at His beck and call, all of them. Countless multitudes of them. His created beings. He's the commander of Israel's armies. He will go before them. He will fight for them. He will make His hailstones to rain down on the enemies. He will give Israel the victory. So they will not, it was not for them to trust in their own might. They're not even trained for battle. They need the Lord to give them the victory if there's going to be any victory at all. Can't hope in their chariots. Can't hope in their weaponry. Can't hope in their strategy. It's all of the Lord. This commander. And he's the commander of the new covenant army that wears the gospel armor. That's us. And goes and does battle. And it's by him that we are more than conquerors. Not in our own strength that we go out. I can't conquer my own sin. Need the Lord. I need the Lord. He says, no. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. God is for God. And we may pause for a moment and say, well, isn't God for Israel? No. God made a covenant with Israel to demonstrate His greatness throughout the earth. And He did. And we read and preach about this greatness Sunday to Sunday. God made a covenant with Israel to demonstrate His greatness. Not to demonstrate Israel's greatness. Sure, Israel was blessed being the covenant people of God. We're blessed being the covenant people of God. All of us new covenant believers with the Spirit of God in us. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake, God saved you because you were so destitute that anything good that would come from somebody like you can only be sourced in Him. That any salvation that has come to you has only come by the free grace of God. Not because of any works of our own hands have we brought this salvation to us. God has saved you as a memorial for His grace. Not because He needed any any one of us. Because God is for God. He saves us for Himself so that He might receive glory. All the blessings of salvation we receive are just ancillary. That we might rejoice in the God that is for Himself. That does all that He does for His own glory. God does not... When we say God is not for us, we mean to say God is for us in the sense that He does things for us, great things for us, saves us from our sin, yes, make no mistake. But when when the commander says to Joshua, no, we say God is for God, God does not unite Himself to your cause. You must unite yourself to His cause. The only cause worth living and dying for. The only cause worth dying in. The only real warfare that's going on between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. 
So point number one, it's never too late to get back to obeying God. And when you do, you will find His promise is still true. Second point, you can expect to meet God when you are faithfully in the midst of serving Him. Third point, God is for God. He does not unite Himself to the causes of men. He doesn't need causes of men. He's for God. Are you for God? Are you united to His cause? Are you advancing His gospel throughout the earth? And if you are for God, then glory is all that you will behold. But if you are for the causes of men, it will be futility. You must be behind God's cause. No, this man is not of Canaanite or Israelite origin. The Lord will dispossess the Canaanites by the Israelites... And then he will later dispossess the Israelites by the Assyrians. God is for God. God is for God. And so Joshua understands this. This one that is for himself is God. And so he does the only proper thing to do when one realizes they're in the presence of God. And that's he falls to the earth and worships. He falls on his face and worships. Everywhere in Scripture when someone bows before another and is said to worship them, one of three things happens. The one being worshipped, the first is that the one being worshipped is a creature. And they rebuke the one that is attempting to worship them. We see that in a couple of places. Paul and Barnabas rebuke the citizens of Lystra. Acts 14, they, oh, this is Zeus and Hermes. Let's bow down and worship them. And Paul and Barnabas say, "Uh uh-uh, we're creatures too. We're only made in the image of God. We're not God. And then the apostle John uh, tries to worship an angel in Revelation 22. Angel says, get up, I'm a created being too. Worship God. That's one of the things that happens. The the creature, if they are a a servant of God, they they will make the one attempting to worship them to stop. Because they fear God and they want only God to be worshipped. Because God is for God, He will not share His glory with another. And worship is only due to God. And so they say, get up. Or the one being worshipped receives the worship as if they were God. And then they perish for it. Because God will not share His glory with another. Because God is for God. That happened to Herod in Acts 12. When he got up and the people said, oh, the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod took that in. He was was swelled up, bloated with pride. And Scripture says he he fell down, was eaten by worms. And by the way, he died. Because God is for God. He's not for Herod. God is for God. And so Herod perished because he received worship, but he wasn't God. They tried, the, the Philistines tried to make uh, Dagon receive worship by putting the ark in the same place as Dagon. Well, these are both holy things, and the Lord said, smash your little idol. God is for God. He doesn't share His glory with another. And the third thing is that when a, 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 a being receives worship, and they don't perish from it, and they don't tell them, the, the worshipers, to cease and desist. We conclude that it's God. When the scriptures say the angel of the Lord shows up and the angel of the Lord is worshipped, you know that's not a created angel. That's God. That's the Son of God. And He appears many times in the Old Testament. Here He appears to Joshua. And He's worshipped. And He can receive worship. Because He is God the Son. He is the God-man. Although this is, Even though He appears as a man, He doesn't have His flesh. And, and, and yet, that will come later. And so, the one being worshipped receives worship because He's God-manifest. And it's proper that He should be worshipped. Anything less is improper. Because God is for God. And He ought to be worshipped at all times and places. Preparing for war ought to be worshipped. In the midst of the battle, must be worshipped. After the victory is won, must be worshipped. 
all times and all places. And so when Joshua beheld the glory of God, he did the only two things one can do in exactly the order one should do them. First is he bowed down. The general of Israel bowed before the general of generals and worshipped. There's no degree of humility beneath any of the general's subjects. We must all give him the worship he is due because God is for God. And then secondly, Joshua reverently asked, What's the word you have for me? I recognize you are the general over me. What are my marching orders? Because he could have planned and plotted all he wanted to. It's what God gives us as our marching orders that is most important. How God wants us to accomplish his mission. How God wants us to win the battle is how we're going to win it. So Joshua said, what word do you have for me, my Lord? It's important that we get that order right. Because if we are not first worshiping God, we are in no place to serve God. Our hearts must be full of worship before God, and then service will follow. You cannot help but serve such a great God, whom you have, whom you have, whom you are worshiping before. You want to serve Him, because he's, he's for God. He's the only one worth serving. And so, if we are worshiping, then we are in the place to serve God. God can do anything we, we can do for Him. He can already do that all for Himself. He doesn't need us, but it's a privilege that we get to serve the God that is for Himself, for His own glory. Privilege that He allows our lives to have some meaning. It keeps us from living for our own pathetic glory, which is no glory at all. But what we need more than anything is to recognize our place, that God is for God, I must unite myself with Him, with His cause. And I must worship Him before I entreat Him, before I ask anything of Him. Even what He would have me to do. What He has, what He would have me to do is worship Him. And then if I need specific orders beyond that, I can ask after having worshipped Him for the God that He is. Before I do anything for Him, before He does anything for me, recognize how glorious He is. Fall down before Him and worship. Then I can hear from Him what He would have me to do. No doubt we have much to ask God for, but God has much glory that He is due. And so let our entreaties come after we have worshipped God. In the midst of our worshipping God, that must come first. And so the first action that Joshua is told to take is the same directive Moses received. Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place you are standing is holy. There's his first orders. Joshua did so. The same holy God that spoke with Moses now speaks with Moses' successor in exactly the same way. He meets him on holy ground. He speaks to him audibly. And whatever high thoughts Joshua had of taking the city in his own strength, they're now cast aside with his shoes. I'm before the Lord, before whom all men are accountable, the Lord who is for himself, for his own glory. Because for him to be for anything less would be sin for him. And so when Moses prays in Deuteronomy 9, Lord, save this people, he doesn't plead the righteousness of the people. He doesn't say, well, we're we're such a noble people. We're so good. We've obeyed you. We've plundered Egypt and have all these treasures to offer you. No, he pleads, God, you are for God. So do not destroy this people lest your enemies say, God could not bring them to the place that he promised. God could not do all for them that he was going to do and thereby glorify himself. Lord, get glory for yourself by bringing this people to the place you've promised them. They might know that you are God, that you are for God. And that you will do all that you set out to do for your own glory. So a greater might than the armies of Jericho is now before Joshua and he realizes it. He casts his shoes aside. So we first bow in worship and ask what God would have us to do. Fourth point of the outline, that is it. And then we immediately do all that and only that. 
And it's a wonderful four-word testimony of Joshua there, and he did so. Joshua did so. I, I'd like to be on my tombstone. All the Lord wanted me to do, Micah did so. God, give me the grace. This is my prayer for us as well, that all the Lord have us to do as a church, we would do that, only that and all that. Bow in worship before the Lord, and then what would you have me to do, Lord? That which the Lord commanded was obeyed completely and without delay. What a wonderful testimony. Every, if we didn't have anything else of Joshua, this would be worthy of, um, worthy of emulation. The God that is for God. Receiving worship from Joshua. Gives orders to Joshua and Joshua obeys. And so after he had worshipped, and obeyed the, the word of the Lord. Then he was giving marching orders. And they were actually just that, march. He came to Joshua with a sword out. But didn't ask Joshua, to have your swords out and go ransack Jericho in the morning. Nope. I need you to march six days. And on the seventh, sound the trumpet and the walls are going to come down. And then after you have worshipped me by seeing what, you, what I will do for you, what I will do for you, my people, because I'm for God and I'm going to fulfill all my promises because my glory is at stake. Then you get your swords out. And then you go sack Jericho. And maybe, maybe you're at a place where the Lord has commands, has directives in your life and it's not true that you've done so. Well, it's never too late to get back to obeying God. If you've wandered in the wilderness for a time, then we can recognize you need to get back to obeying God because He's for God. He's for God. He cannot be for anything less. Whatever He does for His creatures is ultimately for His own glory. Take heart. It's never too late to get back to obeying God. And when you do, you find His promises are still true. You find that His promise of restoring the years the locusts have eaten are still true. You know, it, 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 it's, it's sad in the sense that Caleb and Joshua were made to wait too in the desert. And you kind of think, well, that's not really fair that Caleb and Joshua had to wait before going in. They were ready. They were ready to go. And now they're punished with, because God's for God. Yeah, he made them wait. And yet Joshua did get to go in and found that the promises of God were true. He did get to enjoy the land. And then you can expect God to meet with you. You realize you've not been walking in the way of righteousness. That you need to get back to obeying God. You can expect God to meet with you in the midst of faithfully serving Him. I just want to see God. Get to obeying Him. Worship Him. Bow before Him. Follow His commands. And He will meet with you. And then remember that He does not unite Himself with the causes of men. That if you have spent time in your own cause, that we are called to serve one greater, or greater than Joshua. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He is for Himself. That's a great comfort. You know, we look around and think, oh boy, if all, the, all these noble causes and I just don't know if I can you know, fund these, fuel these. God's for God and He's going to grow His church. So that's where concentrate your time, your resources, your efforts. I will build my church. It's our, our job as soldiers in His band to carry forth His gospel. And as we do, He'll meet us. He'll give to us what we need to bring it about. We need to love our enemies. God will fill us, our hearts, with holy love. We need to be bold in giving the gospel. He will bring it. He appeared with a sword to Joshua. How will He appear less to us who need to love our enemies? We need to share the gospel with others. We need to comfort the brokenhearted. He'll give us a word of comfort in that time. Can He fail to, to, to use us to help us? To bring glory to His name by advancing His gospel. He's for God. Are we for God? And then God must be worshipped before He's to be entreated. We ask God for things. 
Nothing wrong with that. He tells us to ask him for things. But let's worship him. Our Father chart in heaven comes before give us this day our daily bread. Let's bow down and worship him. Then we can ask, Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? You're a God worth serving. We recognize that in worship. You are the God who is for God. These other gods can do nothing for themselves. We can do nothing for ourselves. This God is for God. Lord, draft me into your army. Make me one of yours. That's my prayer for my son. Lord, raise him up to be a mighty man of God. That his whole life would be, would be spent serving the Lord. Not, his name would not be remembered. Even though it's a fine name his mother picked out. But that the name of the Lord will be remembered. Because God is for God. God is for God. Are you, are you for God? If you are, then I hope you will be as Joshua. Bow before the Lord. Serve Him. Ask Him what you'd have Him to do. And don't depart from the tent. This is where we come to be in the presence of God. And to hear the Word preached to our souls. That we might be encouraged. That we might be reminded of the God who is for Himself and for His own divine glory. And that we allows us to see it and partake of it, the taste of His goodness. So, is my prayer that the uh, Lord would uh, take us up and use us to advance His causes in this His earth that He alone might receive glory. Father and our God, we are grateful that even though You are for Your glory, you do not enjoy your glory by yourself, but you've made us, your creatures, to experience it with you. Father, we thank you that we who have no glory get to behold glory in you. We thank you that you make covenants with us to do us good to, and to glorify yourself. We, we thank you that you lead us onward into battle. You grant us a victory. Lord, this week I pray that you would grant us a victory in our own hearts over sin. And that the, the sin that we cherish the most, we would deal the most violently with. And that you would grant us a victory over the world. And that temptations that spring up, you would grant us a victory over them. That we would follow our captain and we would tread all idols under underfoot. And that you would... Uh, help us, give us boldness in, in presenting your, your word, your gospel in this world that is so devoid of, of glory and of truth, who despises you. And Lord, we, we pray that you would uh, help us to always be worshiping you, Lord, that in the new covenant every place is holy ground. That you've called us, your commands for your church are to take the gospel into all the world. And so, Pray that you make us ever worshiping you, that we would be ready to say a word in season, that we would uh, spend our entire lives uh, serving you, Lord, that, that for all eternity we might enjoy uh, you. Pray that you would help us to abandon those causes that are not of you, and, and that you would forgive us for uh, seeking your allegiance with our own vain causes, that you would help us to concentrate our time, our resources, our abilities, all our effort into uh, serving you. And we pray that you make us to fear you. That you are the God whose robe is dipped in blood, whose sword proceeds out of your mouth. That you will slay your enemies. Lord, if there are some here who are not yet among the ranks of your soldiers, Lord, that you would call them to yourself. Call your sheep into the fold. That you would uh, save them by your grace. Show them the futility of living apart from you. There is no life apart from you. We, we pray these things in your name. Amen. We will close with a hymn together.